let's start with edge players first. And in terms of the Giants roster, they sit here with two players that are edge players that are free agents currently. Kyler Fackrell, who ended up being really, when he was healthy, their primary edge player once Lorenzo Carter and O'Shane Zimenez got hurt. And then Jabal Shared, who was a situational pass rusher for the most part late in the year when he was brought in midseason after all those aforementioned injuries. So the Giants welcome or welcoming him back, Lorenzo Carter, and they're welcoming him back, O'Shane Zimenez. But after that, guys, it, it's kind of an open field here in terms of what the Giants' edge position will look like next year. Of course, folks, when I say edge, I'm talking outside linebackers on first and second down or running situations, and then sometimes on third down, those guys will put their hand in the dirt and they'll rush the passer. So, Paul, let's start with you. Anybody else on this roster jump out to the edge spot that's returning other than Lorenzo Carter and O'Shane Zimenez? Yeah, you know, John, to me, I'm just uh... – I'm looking at this. And Just I, say no. It's okay. <laughs> I mean, no. No, I'm, I'm not overly excited because, to me, I like Carter as a strong sideline backer, so I don't necessarily think you're going to get a lot of pass rush out of him the way that I would utilize him, although I would have him charge the line of scrimmage more as a stand-up guy than he did uh, two years ago in his last healthy season. Having said that, I honestly don't know what the ceiling for Zimenez is. If I could be more confident of that, I would have an answer for you. But right now, he is the great unknown for me. I mean, that's like diving into the Bermuda Triangle and not knowing what you're going to see in the water. I would love to see you do that, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah me too. well, but that's how I feel. Mm -hmm. I, I Look, I like the kid. I think he's a really great young man. He's a terrific teammate. He knows he's got a lot to learn. He knows he was raw, you know, coming out of school. Um, but his his development was stunted by the injury last year. Is he potentially an eight or nine sack guy? I, I don't know. I, I hope he is, but I don't know. Jeff, how do you view the combination of Carter Coughlin and Cam Brown? They're guys that played over the course of the year. Cam Brown, more of a special team, or Carter Coughlin got some snaps on defense late in the year. Then they kind of pulled back from him again the last couple of games after Fackrell came back. So how do you view those guys in terms of their role? And this is why I want to do edge and mm -hmm. linebacker on the same day, right? Because they kind yeah. of overlap on those spots a little bit. So how do you view their roles going forward? Well, I think that both of them proved that they belong um, in the know, league. They were, yeah, well, yeah. in the league, but you know, they were they were drafted later in in the draft. So I think they they had something to prove. And as you saw at the end of the season, those guys got a lot more playing time. So, um, and with Coach Judge, I think that's deserving. You know, as you go on, you're not just going to play unless you deserve to be in there. He'll tell you that. Um, with the other guys, I think that we kind of know what we're going to get out of them. We're just waiting for them to produce. I, I think that, that Carter is the one that, that I scratch my head at because I think this is a big year for him. Um, I think it's time for him to ascend. What's his um, I Oh, you mean Lorenzo Carter or Lorenzo Carter? Carter. Okay, yeah, Lorenzo Carter. Two um, Carters. I'm going to make yeah, sure you right. got the right one. No, yeah. <laughs> Lorenzo Carter. Um, and I think that Zimenez is another guy who's just a little bit raw still, you know, from Old Dominion that doesn't, doesn't, didn't play at a high, high level of college football. And I think that with the injury last year, um, so both of those guys have a lot to prove. They've got some depth behind them. And I think this is where – we start to talk about uh, free agents, and we start to talk about the draft and improving those positions and seeing if they can bring in some guys to compete with them. Paul, you know, you're – yeah, Go ahead, oh, Jeff. Paul, I just I'm want sorry. to add this yeah, one please, thing, go John. Ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that Brown is a terrific special teams player. I'm not sure that he's ever going to project to anything more than a spot player on the defense. Now, I think I do think he has the tools, Paul, if he can develop I, his I game disagree. to do I, it. I, I believe that, he, that he has some upside to him. I'm concerned about his speed and quickness. Okay. And and that, for me, is, is an issue because this game is just getting faster and faster and faster all the time. Well, Paul, I agree. I'm not sure he's a coverage guy, but I think he's a guy that can help you on first and second down. But I do, you know, and one thing that I think that you guys will agree with me here is that Patrick Graham understands, you know, what his deficiencies are. So he's going to put him in, in areas and on the field where he's going to succeed. So he's not, you know, if you don't think he can cover, he's not going to be in there on third down. So I think that let's 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 give him a chance to see what he can do with his hand in the dirt or and moving to that quarterback. But he's got a lot of work to do. And I agree with you there, Paul. But Paul, well, you, well, you know, if your point, if, if I don't think it's fair to project him as a future like three down starting linebacker. Of that, you're absolutely right. No argument from me. 
Yeah. Well, that was your original question, right? Yes, what, correct. What, what, uh-huh. Where is where is the upside guy who might be able to excite you in that well, regard? And even upside, like, but what, like, what, what's the role? Because I feel like both Brown and Coughlin, we don't really know what their role is. Like, if they do become starters, what's their position? You know, how do you use them? I think this is stuff that's kind of up in the air a little bit, right? Yeah, I, I, I think that Carter Coughlin, to me, between him and Brown, has Carter Coughlin, upside. for me, is the guy who I'm a little more intrigued by. Me too. I would, I, I would say that's, yeah. I, I kind of think if between the two of them, Carter Coughlin has a better chance of being a three-down linebacker than Brown. And, and in some regard, and I... I Boy, I, I really hesitate to say this because, you know, um, um, the guy, when he got to the Giants, he, he, he was all done. Um, the guy from the Rams that they signed two years ago. Oh, wait, you mean the guy from um, – From Philly. From he Philly. was in Philly. From Philly. Oh, uh, yeah, the guy who did all the spin moves in training yeah. camp, and he looked good, but we just realized the offensive yeah. tackles were oh, bad. Oh, my good – come uh, on, Jeff, help <laughs> us. Connor Barwin. Connor Barwin. Connor Thank Barwin. You, Barwin. There yep, you go. Thank you. Yeah, I, I I see him as that type of player now. Same body reach, type, good call, right? Yeah. So, exactly. but now the and and he's got moves too. He he does work hard, and he's got moves, and he's a blue collar guy, and he looks like he's got the potential to be an overachiever. Well, Connor Barwin was that kind of player. And by the way, Coughlin also tested off the charts at the combine. Yes, too. right. Mm-hmm. Yes. No, I mean, I'm saying Carter Coughlin tested off the chest, not Carter Bowen. I'm sorry. Right, Carter. right. But but yes. that's why I see them as very similar guys. All right. Barwin just a little bit bigger, but I see them as yep. very similar kind of players. Now, Carter Barwin had some really good years in this league. So if if Coughlin can, can reach that full potential, maybe he could be a three down backer. Yeah, I think it's possible. I think he has the athleticism to do it. I think. On third downs, I see him more of a pass rusher than I see him as a coverage guy, as a blitzer or right. someone that you send off the edge. And I think he's really like, you know, he's kind of round peg, round hole, I think, as a 3-4 outside linebacker. I think that's kind of just what he's going to be in the NFL. I think that's his fit. So I do think with the giant scheme, that works. All right, Paul, you mentioned Zimenez. I'm with you. I still like his raw pass rush potential. I think he has moves. I still wonder about his strength. I think he's got the quickness in the hands. I'm just not sure about the power to hold up on the edge for long periods of time. And as for Lorenzo Carter, and I'd like to get your guys' take on this. You know, to me, he's a really good linebacker, but I don't think he's a really good pass rusher yet. And the problem you run into is that these outside linebackers in the 3-4, in a lot of ways, you need them to be both. You need them to be able to rush the passer, and you need them to be able to, to do the other things you want linebackers to do. I almost think Carter, in his ideal situation, if I was to create in a laboratory, his best spot would be a 4-3 outside linebacker. I think that's where he would be uh, the best in his role. I think he'd be very good in that spot. But that's not a spot that really exists on the Giants' defense, per se. So I think he's a really good player. I just wonder, you know, how they see him. Because when he got hurt in those first couple games, he was playing as more snaps than he was playing as many snaps as, like, the safeties on the team. He was playing, like, 90% of the snaps. Pass rusher, mm-hmm. off-ball guy, or rather on-the-line guy, um, but not a pass rusher on first and second down. So I think he can do a little bit of everything. I'm just not sure he's that guy that you're going to depend, Jeff, on third down to get after the quarterback. Well, I think his off-the-ball uh, speed is good. I think that um, I just think that he plays too high, if you will. I, and I think that he gets caught up with those big, big tackles, um, and they basically smother him. I don't know how many different moves he has to get to the quarterback, and I think that, that that's what stops him. And I think it's a good point you make, John, because maybe he is in the wrong system. Maybe he, maybe he should be a 4-3 outside guy. But, but the fact of the matter is that they're going to have to find a way for him to get better, um, if not because I think the ceiling is, is pretty close to him right now. I have not seen a great jump that I thought that the Renzo Carter would have from year two to three. Now we need to see it from three to four. How about you, certainly. Paul? Well, there wasn't enough evidence last year to mm-hmm. show it. I, I thought he had a hell of a camp. He was starting was, to come into his own, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah. I was looking forward to it. And then yep. we just didn't get enough of a body of work for, out of him. And, you know, the bottom line is I thought he was wasted in James Betcher's system. You know, I was sick and tired of seeing him with his hand in the dirt all the time. 
and they were making him a rush linebacker, and he was not getting any penetration, and he was not getting any kind of pass rush because he doesn't have any great slick pass rushing moves. Mm-hmm. And they basically they wasted him. Every time on third down when they put his hand down in the dirt, they were playing with 10 men on, on defense because he, he, he was not fit for that spot, and they took him out of his wheelhouse. Right, and that goes back to my point, right? Better linebacker than a pass Without rusher. Without a doubt. Right. Without a doubt. And see, I think I, I would agree with you, John, in that I think he's a better strong side 4-3 linebacker than he is anything else. Having said that, I do think he can play strong side linebacker in a 3-4 as more of a point of attack guy, a guy who goes down the line and chases down running backs, a guy who holds the edge, uh, a guy who can really give tight ends if they want him to. And I'd love to see him have a class with Carl Banks and beat the living hell out of the tight end who lines up opposite him because nobody does that in this league anymore, and it needs to be done. And, Car- and uh, Carter can do that. I agree. And that's that to me. I, I'd love to to get him in my laboratory. I would I would get the best out of Lorenzo Carter. I'm, trust me. I'm with you, Paul. I think that would be the best way to use him if you were going to try to figure out a role for him. And you know, we talked Paul a lot in December about what this free agent edge class was going to look at look like. And now we're talking mostly pass rushers here because the Giants, as we know, could use a more consistent pass rush off the edge. And actually, in my opinion, I think the class is actually pretty deep. You know, you don't have that super duper star at the top after you get by Shaq Barrett who I think is you know maybe not you know a top 5 pass rusher but at very least a the top 10 or 15 guy in the league then you have JJ Watt who obviously is is an older guy he's going to be looking for a team that's going to compete for a Super Bowl Jadavian Clowney we're not going to relitigate him we talked about him enough last offseason I think people know what we feel about him Yannick Ngakwe another guy we talked a lot about last year but then you get to the group poll that I think is interesting Mm-hmm. Like to me, a guy like Carl Lawson coming from Cincinnati, I remember I watched him a lot heading into that Cincinnati game, preparing for that game last year. He, to me, as a third down pass rusher, was very impressive. He's a guy where if the cost isn't prohibitive, I think he'd be a great fit as an edge rusher in passing situations on this Giants defense. Then you have a couple of veterans. Melvin Ingram is a guy who's kind of on not tail end, might be a little bit strong, but he's been in the league a while. He's dealt with some injuries. Bud Dupree, who mm-hmm. is another guy. But, again, I'm not the biggest fan of his. Leonard Floyd, I think you worry about his stat inflation playing next to Aaron Donald last year. We saw that with Dante Fowler a couple years ago, right? He plays next to Aaron Donald. He's great. He leaves all of a sudden not so great. Trey Hendrickson, a guy from the Saints who had double-digit sacks last year. Nobody talks about him. 270 pounds. Bigger guy. He's somebody I think is interesting. Matthew Judon's probably going to get a big big contract. How about Hassan Reddick? Is he a guy that can be a situational pass rusher for you on third downs if you ask him to rush the passer? That's someone that would interest me. So I do think there are some guys here, and we talked about the market this year with the cap where it might be down. Some of these second-level rushers like the Carl Lawsons, like the Hendricksons, like the Reddicks, those are guys that I think could actually provide Jeff some value in free agency if you get them on the right contract. 100%. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's all a matter of money. You know, what is the team going to be able to afford for some of these guys that you, uh, that you mentioned from top to bottom? I mean, a Matthew Judon, he's, you know, he's a guy I see like I like him. I think he could fit into the Giants uh, real nicely and not command a whole, whole lot of money. Alden Smith is another guy that we could we could talk about a little bit, but um, I think that it, the real question here, John, is is all about economics. Where is the money going to be to to sign one of these edge guys, or do is it do we go to the draft and and try to find somebody through there? So, um, if I'm the coaching staff, I'm definitely looking at these guys um, because you know free agency is where you fill your needs. And you don't do that through the draft, right? But so where is your need? There is a need for an edge guy after what we just talked about in the current roster. So it'll be interesting to see where the Giants go as far as their money and how they can afford any of these guys that we just talked about. Paul, your thoughts on the free agent I'm going to give you real quick. Sure. Like, I, I, I like Bud Dupree. I think he's a guy that he's – I feel like he always has to prove something. And I think that the way I watched him play this year, especially against the Giants, um, I think he's got something to prove. And I think that he's a guy that maybe if they, 
you know, were to structure his contract in a way that he could be affordable. I, I like him a lot. Now, I remember, really he, he is coming off a torn ACL as well. Yeah, but so. I, I think that he's – but I love his energy. I think he's a guy that I wouldn't worry about that as long as I could get the assurance from the doctors that he's going to be okay. And it might um, actually bring his deal down where he's affordable too. There you go. Honestly. Yeah, absolutely. And Trey Hendricks is another one that I think has a, a tremendous upside. He had a great year this last year. Um, really shot up as far as the numbers go as rankings. But um, – so that's, that's my take on the edge guys for uh, the free agency class. Paul, your thoughts? I don't see the Steelers letting Dupree get away. But if he is, I would if like he, him. If he does get away, and mm-hmm. I don't know what kind of numbers it's going to take. Because... Remember, Paul, the Steelers' salary cap is a mess. Yes, yeah. it is. Yes, it is. Um, boy, I, I, I like Dupree, and had he not gotten hurt, he would have gotten mega bucks, and and I think it would have been harder for the Steelers to keep him. But now mm-hmm. that he's coming off of the injury, they may be able to retain him at more of a discounted rate, and I think it just enhances the chances that he stays. Um, I I'm a big Bud Dupree guy, and actually back in September, I was looking at him when the Giants played them opening day and saying to myself, boy, he'd be a hell of a fit if they could get him in free agency. So let me just say that first, Jeff. I'm with you. Mm-hmm. The other guy, and this just proves that sometimes a leopard can change his spots, and I can be proven wrong at times. <laughs> you will recall, fellas, that Leonard Floyd is a guy I wanted no part of when he came out of the draft and was taken by the Bears in 2016. I thought he was a one-dimensional pass rusher who was light in, 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 the, uh, in the behind, did not show a lot of anchor, did not show a lot of interest in playing the run, and I was so thrilled that the Giants did not wind up with him, despite the fact that many newspapers in this market really yeah, thought that close. he was the perfect guy. And I was like, you've got to be kidding well, I remember me. Remember, a team traded up like, ahead of the Giants to pick him. That's right, to get Correct. him, right. They were one Correct. pick away. Yep. Now, having said that, he had his four years in Chicago, did not live up to expectations, got some money from the Rams, and went there for a year, and now voided out of his deal after a ten-and-a-half sack season. John, the Leonard Floyd that I saw this past season with the Rams, and yes, of course, Aaron Donald is on that line. I understand that. But the Giants have a pretty damn good defensive line themselves. I saw Leonard Floyd that was much more interested in playing the run than he had been in the past, did show horizontal uh, movability or movement to come down the line and get involved in the run game and chase guys a little bit more than he had shown before. And at the same time, I also saw a guy who I thought had elevated his game as a pass rusher as well. I think he is so much better of a player at age 28 than he was at age 24. And I would very much think he would be the perfect fit for the Giants right now. Interesting. All right, let's let's go to the draft class very quickly because we still have to hit off-ball linebackers very fast. And while I don't think there's a guy at 11 that would get me excited, if I'm picking a pass rusher here at the end of the first round, I do think there are some interesting guys with some tools even if they don't have a ton of production. Like Rousseau's the guy we've talked about a lot, 15 sacks two years ago, opted out. We won't spend a ton of time on him. I, I watched Quiddy pay for Michigan on tape. His athleticism and burst and power – is very impressive. Jason Oway from Penn State, just pure speed rusher. He's very raw, but boy, his athleticism is off the charts. Uh, Aziz Ojolari, who's only 240 pounds, but is a 3-4 outside backer. He played for Georgia last year. He was a very effective pass rusher. And then the last guy I'll mention, I've got a few guys for the second round, but, and Jeff, you should be familiar with him. Jalen. Jalen Phillips out of mm-hmm. Miami. I got to tell you, if you just watch the tape, He's my favorite pass rusher in this class. Mm -hmm. The problem is that he's had concussion issues in the past. He actually retired from football for a year, came back, and only has had one dominant year, and that was this year from Miami, and he was dominant. Don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of that other medical health off the field stuff that you have to worry about with him. So I do think there's actually some players to pick at this spot, but I think it's a lot of high-risk guys with either one year of production or some other things where you say, all right, there's things I have to worry about, but I do think there are some edge rushers here with some upside, Jeff, in this class. Yep, again, I think that it's um, when you start going through the draft and you're looking at these guys here, um, how are they going to fit into your scheme? The two guys that you mentioned to Miami 
Um, I got to see more than any of them. Um, and I, I agree with you. I think Jalen Phillips is a little bit more proven than Gregory Rousseau because he sat out and he hasn't played for uh, a year. Um, but, you know, uh, Quiddy Payne is a guy that's not going to be there for the Giants at 11. I think he'll be gone way before that because I think he's obviously the number one edge guy there. Um, but all of these guys bring something that the Giants would like. And I, I just don't – you know, I'm not, I'm not into – Oh, boy, what should I say this? I, if, I did take Gregory Rousseau in my PFF mock draft and got ridiculed by the computer for doing it. But um, I'm into taking one of these edge guys in the draft. It's just a matter of which one of these guys are going to be there, John. But I, I, too, I, will, I would take one of these edge guys. Um, it just depends on which receiver is there, and I'm going to have to make a decision. And round, are, you, are you, uh, You're talking about a round two now, right? I'm or talking about it. No, I'm talking about the top of the, top mm, of the round one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I just heard a Paul rumble. Go ahead, Paul. <laughs> I would have a hard time doing that, Jeff. Yeah, me too. You hear what I said, though? It just depends. If there's a receiver up there, somebody that I, you know, the, one of those big playmaker guys that we talk about, I'm not going to take an edge rusher. Well, I mean, if you, those and, guys, you and I are on the same page here. If Pitts is there at 11, I think we're grabbing him. Well, I think even if there's a receiver there at 11, they're going to take him too, a Waddle or, uh, you know, Devontae. But mm. I, I think that if one of these if, – if, if those playmakers – and John and I were talking about this the other day – that those playmakers are all gone and there's nobody left there that can, you know, offensively, where are you going to go next? I'm going to the defensive line, to the edge rusher, and I'm going to find me one of these guys because I well, can afford them. I can afford them. Part of the problem here for me is that, and, and I've done only preliminary work on this particular position, I see a lot of guys who are second and third round values, and I think these are a bunch of boom or bust guys. Well, yeah, that was think, my but point. But the, guys, right, Paul, that, the guys that Paul just mentioned, do you think these guys are all second, these are all second round guys, you think? Oh, there, there's, there's going to be guys who are going to be taken in the first round, again, because it's a premier position. Everybody wants a pass rusher like everybody wants a quarterback. So there are going to be guys drafted higher than their risk factor indicates they should be. Okay, Rousseau's going to be taken higher than he should be, Jeff. Yep. Even though there's a huge risk there, somebody's going to say, wow, his upside is awesome. We're going to take him based on his upside projection. Sure. sure. That's the problem. So, yeah, you're right. There's going to be probably three or four of these guys that are going to be taken in the first round. What about you, John? Based you, on upside you, uh, projection. Here's what I, I would say one other thing. I, I don't know. I would kind of stay away from any of these guys in the first round. But here's what I will say. It will not shock me at all if we find out two and three years down the road that the guy who was taken in the third or fourth round winds up being the best pass rusher out of the class. I would ag- not shock me. I agree with Paul that this is a high-risk mm-hmm. edge class. I do believe that there are guys with high-end ability that could hit. But I also agree that that guy could get picked 17th or he could get picked 45th, depending uh, on the guy. Like, you have guys like Ronnie Perkins out of Oklahoma, uh, Peyton Turner out of Houston. I mean, there are guys that have a lot of ability because most of these guys only have one year of production and some in limited number of games. So I do think it's hard to kind of to, to figure it out. My opinion is that you will have four or five edge guys selected between picks 10 and 35. Mm -hmm. Whether they deserve to be there, I think I haven't done enough work to to have my big board or anything like that. But I think, to Paul's point, it's such a value position that I think uh, those guys will go sure. that high. All right, 973-667-1960. We'll do off-ball linebackers here very quickly. Then we'll get to the calls. Ryan in Virginia, you will be up first. I promise you that. We'll go through the off-ball linebackers very, very quickly here. But first, I want to remind everybody that limited giant season tickets are on sale now for the 2021 season. In addition to ticket savings, membership benefits include access to exclusive events, experiences, pre-sales, and more. You can lock in your seat starting at just 100 bucks. Call 888-NYG-1925 or visit Giants.com slash tickets for more information. All right, guys, for the Giants, off-ball linebacker, Blake Martinez, we know what he is, solid as a rock, good player. Then you have Tay Crowder, who kind of emerged as the second guy, as the secondary starter. I do think there's still room to improve that second linebacker spot. But just generally, guys, and we'll start with you, Jeff. How do you view that second linebacker spot? Because Tay Crowder played that spot a little bit on passing downs. It was kind of Jabril Pepper's spot. And mm-hmm. you had those other safeties playing behind them with Peppers as a virtual linebacker. So I don't think 
that second linebacker spot next to Martinez is all that critical simply because on those money downs, on those passing downs, Peppers is in that spot a lot, so I'm not sure you need a guy that ha- that needs to be able to play three downs in that second inside linebacker spot. Good point. I think that one of them has to be good enough to be your starter in case Blake Martinez goes out. That's a good point. Um, but the other point is, is that I think that Crowder is going to be penciled in as your guy. I saw enough out of him that I think that, that Coach Graham will play him there. Um, what I'm concerned about is the depth. And, you know, the depth involves special teams guys because those, that linebacker position, they're, they're blanketed on special teams, you know. And, and so and Crowder also played special teams. You got T.J. Brunson was another guy, and, and David Mayo, is he going to be back? Devontae Downs I thought had a, had a down, <laughs> no pun intended, a kind of a down year. So to me, this is a position that has to be upgraded in a sense of depth-wise. But I, I will agree with you, but Tate Crowder, I think, will be the other guy next to him in those first and second downs. But um, if you're going to bring him in on passing downs, then you'll have a safety in there, like you said. So it's interesting because you're looking at this. Uh, now, can Carter Coughlin play a little bit of middle Bingo. linebacker? Bingo! You know, so, <laughs> you're reading my mind, Jeff. There we go. So I think that that might have something to do with a little bit of depth there, but they definitely are going to have to find – you know, another player or two to fulfill that roster um, as far as depth and special teams because you're going to be losing some of these guys. If Carter Coughlin and Tay Crowder and, you know, Cam Brown, those guys are all playing um, starting or playing a lot of snaps on defense, you're going to lose them on special teams. Paul? Yeah, I think the thing with Carter is, again, I I can project that he could be an outside guy, but I also think uh, they may try this year during training camp to work him inside, too, to see how well he can adapt to that role. Well, Paul, if you remember, they actually said, I think it was, what, week five or six last year that they were going to start working him on inside in practice. They did. Mm -hmm. But but I never got to see much of that because practice was basically closed. Well, Paul, the problem is that it was at that point that all the edge players got hurt. Yes. And and, and then I think that ended that experiment because they needed him outside. Correct. So I would like to believe that he's going to get a legitimate chance – to either win a job, if not on the outside, and maybe because of the competition with Zimenez and maybe somebody else that they bring in, maybe they decide, you know what? Hey, Carter, there's a better chance that you're going to get on the field more and earlier if we let you compete on the inside. Oh, and you so, know him. He, he's not going to care where he plays, Paul. He'll play not. anywhere. So mm-hmm. he's going to say, let's go, coach. Give me, give me the snaps. <laughs> and it would not shock me if he was able to win a job on the inside next to Blake Martinez. That would not shock me at all. No, it wouldn't shock me either. And I actually like his upside there. I think he can do it with his athleticism. And for that reason, I don't think the Giants guys are going to be that active in free agency at, yeah. at inside linebacker. I just no. I just don't not see Not of it. any of the guys that are there that, that you would think that they would no, be interested and in. No, and just so people know who they are, top of the board free agent market, Levante David, Matt Milano, Jayon Brown, K.J. Wright, Denzel Perryman. I don't see the Giants dipping into that pool and grabbing one of those guys. No. And the draft is interesting, and, and we could start with Micah Parsons, guys, because I think he's the one guy that, that isn't in the mix at 11. Linebackers are tough to evaluate to me. You have to watch a lot of film on a linebacker to get a feel for the type of player he is because you need to see his feel for the position and things like that, and you don't get that from just watching you know, a, a, a bunch of passes defended or a bunch of pass rushes. You kind of really got to get a feel for it. I probably watched about an hour and change of his stuff this morning. What I like about him is that he can do the two things you want from a linebacker. He's athletic enough to run sideline to sideline, and he's not afraid to take on contact in the hole to stop the run. So if you can do those two things, you can be a three-down linebacker in the league. I got to admit, it didn't. the tape didn't jump off and, like, wow me. I wasn't, like, falling off my chair like, oh, man, this is, like, the most impressive stuff I've ever seen. But he does have three-down linebacker potential. And I would understand why he would be in the mix there at number 11. Yeah, but here's the problem, John. Um, when you match the need component with the value component, he kind of loses a little ground. I'm, I'm with you. See, I look at Parsons, and he is one of the, the linebackers I have actually had a chance to look at so far. Uh, he is going to be, for me, to get maximum value out of his potential, he's got to be a middle linebacker in a 4-3, or an inside backer in a 3-4. He has to play Blake Martinez's position is basically mm-hmm. what you're okay. saying. Because he's a tackling machine. Like <laughs> and that. Right. <laughs> now, there are some people who hear him and they go, oh, and maybe they haven't watched him play a lot, and that's possible. But I hear people saying, oh, 
take 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 Parsons, play him as outside linebacker. I, he's going to rush the quarterback. I heard that too, and then I watched him this morning, and I it's did not, not a good I, idea. I did not see that at all. You, I'm with you, you. You're misusing him, hundred percent. And you'd make the same mistake that that they did with Lorenzo Carter a couple of years ago. Don't take a, a square peg and try to fit it into a round hole just because you think he's going to be a great player. That that would be a mistake. And that's my problem with Parsons. Now, if they take Parsons at 11 and say, okay, you're going to line up next to Blake Martinez, and the two of you guys are going to dominate because you're going to stuff everything between the tackles and you're going to have Parsons running sideline to sideline, well, that's great. It's a tremendous upgrade, and he's a terrific player. But I just don't think he fits their their need as well as I would like the number 11 pick to fit. Jeff. No, 100%. I, I just don't think that, number one, I don't think he'll be there, but I think he will fit into a nice a nice system somewhere else. But I think that for the Giants' purposes, you've got enough at that. I think Blake Martinez, you went out and got him, paid him a lot of money. He produced. Um, I think he will always continue to produce, but I still think there's duplication with these two guys at that position. I do think in the second round there's a couple interesting coverage guys that are good in coverage that you could think about. Jabril Cox out of LSU, Justin Hilliard of Ohio State, Jamin Davis out of Kentucky. Guys that I think, all right, I could see these guys being, you know, helpful as coverage guys. But again, I think that overlaps with what you're getting out of Peppers in those third down situations. So I just, I'm just not sure that the inside off ball linebacker is going to be a huge priority given the young guys they drafted last year, the presence of Blake Martinez. I just don't think that's going to be high on their list of, oh, we really need to add one of these guys. Yeah, I think that I think the the, the group that's here now, there's plenty of of, of ability to improve. There's a lot of competition there, and I think that they, if they're going to do this, John, I think they'll do it later um, to yeah. be to kind of guys come in here and let that person come in here, play some special teams, and push these other guys. And I do like Jabril Cox as a guy that you had mentioned from LSU. Um, you know, a guy that can cover. He, I, I watched a little bit of tape on him. He's got good speed, he's good, good height, six foot four, and so you know, and he's, I guess he's, I'm looking at the PFF rank right now. He's 45th. Um, on the big board for PFF. So that's a second round guy, maybe, maybe a third round, you know, so maybe he has some value there for the Giants. Who knows? Yeah. And Paul, to me, this is actually, and you don't hear this very often about the position is actually a pretty deep off ball linebacker class. If you want to get somebody third, fourth round, you could probably get a pretty decent player. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would suspect as much too, John. And also I think what you said a minute or so ago about the usage and how the Giants really would only have that guy maybe be on the field for, for a couple of downs. Look, I think that Tay Crowder and the analytics people can go jump in a lake because Tay Crowder showed me something last year, and I don't care what kind of grading system they're using. They didn't watch football. Tay Crowder did some very impressive things last year just as a rookie, showed enough of flashes to get me excited about him that he could definitely help in that fashion. Now, having said that, okay, here's the other thing to keep in mind. I would not be surprised, given what Patrick Graham's uh, interest is in mixing up things defensively. We talked about this a little bit last year as speculation, and it really didn't come to fruition because of some of the injuries they had. But, John, would it surprise you at all if we saw some more dime and quarters defenses where you saw extra defensive backs on the field? And might there be times when Martinez is the only linebacker on the field? I think we saw that a lot in the last year, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. Out of mm -hmm. necessity, he did some of that only because he had to. But I'm talking about might he work that in as a regular part yes. of his season-long rotation? Yes, I believe that is. And that was a point I was trying to make, right, where Peppers is almost your quasi-second linebacker. Okay, so, yeah. you know, and remember now, McKinney's supposed to be healthy all season. Right, so you'd have McKinney and Logan as your safeties. Maybe Julian Love's on the field, too. The hell knows. And then Absolutely. Is there, so. yeah. it's, it, it is definitely possible that you could have five or even six uh, uh, and, you know, defensive backs on the field in, in, a, in a lot of different formations on a lot of these weeks, not just because out of necessity they were so desperate in a situation where they had to throw guys out there. I could see him using that as part of his regular scheme. 